All right, welcome everyone to this lecture on labor market policy. Uh, as you know, this is a very unusual semester uh, where we won't have any in-person lectures. Instead, I'm going to record um, all of my lectures, or actually not my lectures, but um, I'm going, I'll be going through the slides um, and you know tell you something about those slides um, and uh, record myself while I'm doing that. And you can download these files and uh, listen to them um, whenever you please um, and yeah hopefully uh, it will be I mean of course it's not going to be ideal uh, but I hope it will be uh, helpful for you to prepare for the exams um, so um, yeah that's what we are going to do uh, this term um, so let me uh, let me start um, as you know, the this uh, lecture was uh, scheduled to take place uh, on Friday um, from two to uh, from twelve to two, um, and uh, obviously there would have been consultation hours. Um, as it seems now, we won't be having in-person lectures, and accordingly, we won't be having in consultation hours. So, if you have any questions, you can uh, send me uh, send me them via email, and if they are of you know, general interest, uh, I'll, um, I'll compile a PDF with all of the questions I get and, you know, post them for everyone to download. Um, and if they are just, you know, sort so of questions that are um, <clears throat> only only of, sort of minor interest for everyone else, then I'll just answer them. Um, so, again, instead of consultation hours, just send me emails with your questions. Um, of course, you know, just don't send inundate me with too many emails. Uh, just send them only if you if you really uh, are struggling with you know with some issues, um, some of the content of this course. Um, and instead of in-person lectures, we'll be having you know you can you you'll be downloading the lecture notes and you know listening hopefully listening to these recordings. Uh, there's a tutorial. Um, I assume that. Um, we won't be able to hold them either. Um, so what we'll be doing instead is basically the same uh, what we are doing for the lecture. Uh, namely, uh, there will be audio recordings, and uh, you will be able to download the um, the uh, exercise sheets and uh, and example solutions, and then you know you will be expected to go through them by yourself. Uh, at the end of the lecture, there will be an exam. Again, I'm not sure how how we will be organizing them. Uh, I guess this will transpire, you know, as the semester progresses. But in general, you know, the exam will last um, uh, sixty minutes, um, and there will be two examination dates, uh, as we usually would have. Uh, again, the semester is anything but usual. So let's see uh, how will how things will transpire. Um, all of the material uh, for the lecture and uh, the tutorial uh, can be either downloaded from Unisono or I'll be posting links on Unisono uh, where you can sort of from which you can uh, then proceed to download uh, all the material. Uh, you may also want to check my personal homepage where I may be posting some information as well. Uh, all right, this is the lecture. Uh, this is the literature for this course. Um, so again, this is a course on labor market policy. So uh, ultimately, we'll be uh, dealing with um, labor supply and labor demand, and uh, this is a this is a topic which is fairly fundamental to to economics. So there are many um, textbooks that um, deal with this topic. Um, you may pick up any of these textbooks that I list here because all of them are. You know, fairly basic, um, and cover all of basically all of the material that we will be covering in this lecture. Uh, for example, um, you know, there's one that I've highlighted. Um, you could go and and um, you know grab uh, Boyhouse uh, Labor Economics um, uh, textbook. Um, I guess there may be uh, so I, I've, I've noted the fourth edition uh, of this textbook, but I guess there will be new editions by now. So just um, <clears throat> just check for yourself um, and this is the uh, outline of the course uh, so um, uh, 
uh, as I've mentioned, we will be dealing with uh, labor market policy, which means basically that we will be dealing with uh, the labor market. Uh, and the labor market, as any market, consists of you know, two sides. Uh, first of all, uh, the supply side. So we will be dealing with labor supply. You know, how does labor supply come about? Uh, what does determine the extent of labor supply, etc. Um, the second part of the lecture. The third part of the second part of the lecture will be labor demand. Um, so uh, you know how do firms um, determine how much labor they want to demand? So that's going to be sort of the question that we will be dealing with in this in this part of the lecture. And then finally, we will be bringing supply and demand together and discuss uh, labor market equilibria. Um, uh, and uh, after that, you know uh, we will be. Um, We'll be uh, talking about why uh, there may be uh, in particular unemployment in a, in a particular labor market equilibrium. As you may know, markets typically should uh, should be should clear. You know, prices should adjust such that demand exactly equals uh, supply. But nonetheless, you know, in reality, we observe uh, in many in many countries. Uh, various points in time, the existence of unemployment, uh, which is something that our standard neoclassical model cannot easily explain. So, you know, we'll be discussing why uh, there may be unemployment, even if the labor market functions as a proper market. Um, all right, so that's sort of the, the outline of this, of this course, fairly straightforward. We'll be discussing labor supply, then we'll be discussing labor demand, then we'll be discussing uh, the equilibrium, uh, the, the equilibrium in the labor market, and finally, um, you know, we'll be discussing why in an, in a labor market equilibrium there may be um, there may be unemployment, uh, why there may be um, you know resources in this case labor not being adequately used. All right, okay, so let's start with uh, some you know introductory remarks. Um, so wh why do we care about the labor market. Uh, why is it uh, why is it important to understand why labor markets uh, function? Why they uh, may uh, when they may be uh, in an equilibrium, and why in a particular ex equilibrium there may be resources that are not adequately used? Why there may be unemployment, so to speak? Um, so obviously, unemployment is um, one of the greatest problems in so in societies since uh, you know several decades uh, in many countries at different points in time. Um, Germany has been doing quite well and the US has been qu doing quite well up until you know quite recently but as you will observe you know <laughs> things will go downhill probably in the next uh, couple of months uh, hopefully only in the next couple of months but who knows. Uh, um, so um, it's it's important to understand you know why <clears throat> Why there may be unemployment? Why labor? How labor markets function, and why they may misfunction? Um, so there are two perspectives on this issue. One is a macro perspective, and another one is a micro perspective. Um, so from a macroeconomic perspective, um, unemployment uh, is maybe problematic because, as I've mentioned, valuable resources aren't used. Um, there may be social costs. Um, uh, personal costs, etc., um, uh, and then you know there are these all these fiscal costs uh, due to the fact that unemployed people do have to be uh, supported by the government in the form of unemployment benefits, which may lead to higher taxes, etc., etc. So uh, because of unemployment, there may be all sorts of other distortions that uh, you know um, make the economy less efficient. Um, and then there's a micro perspective to which I will come later on, but you know, uh, you know let's let's start out with this micro perspective. Um, um, here's a, here are some statistics on uh, uh, unemployment rates across different countries at different points in time, and as you can see, there's a lot of variation both within countries over time as well as across countries at one point in time. Uh, so it's a, it's it's an obvious question to ask why. There are these variations. You know, how, how does it come about that 
say Germany in 2015 had an unemployment rate of 4.6, whereas in 2005 it had you know twice uh, 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 an employment rate that was twice as high. Uh, or why in 2015 um, the unemployment rate in say Japan was so much lower than in uh, than in let's say Spain, right? Um, but it was like 22.1 percent as compared to 3.4 percent in, in Japan. Okay, so these are sort of questions that at the at the face of it you know you can't really. Answer, e uh, answer easily, um, you will need to have some theory, some model in your mind, uh, or you need to have developed some theory in order to answer that particular question. Okay, so from macroeconomic perspective, so there are two ways to address this uh, this question. One would be, um, you know, from a in an ad hoc fashion from a macroeconomic perspective, and another one would be um, from a microeconomic perspective. So, from a macroeconomic perspective, um, one way to sort of get at this, uh, get at this issue, get at this, uh, the ex get at this high degree of variation across countries on normal time, is to f sort of claim that there's, uh, or at least you know, one sort of model uh, or attempt to understand these differences is to claim that there's some type of employment threshold. Uh, which means that um, there's a relationship between economic growth and unemployment and that there's some threshold beyond which uh, economic growth starts to reduce unemployment. Uh, okay, so... Um, so... Um, there must be a real growth rate at least of at least X percent in order to unemployment to start declining. Um, so this is an empirical question obviously you need to f know if there's such a growth rate if there's such a threshold you need to uh, empirically determine where it exactly is okay and there's uh, and you know the way to do that would be to or one way to do that would be to just correlate um, within one country unemployment rate uh, against growth rate over time uh, and as you can see there's um, uh, for the U.S., there is a negative relationship between uh, the growth rate of real GDP and the change in the unemployment rate, and um, and um, the change in the unemployment rate, you know, becomes becomes negative at a growth rate at about uh, I don't know, this is probably like three percent. Um, so that would be uh, the the the, um, the threshold growth rate in the U.S. Uh, over that period, at least about you know three uh, percent. People have estimated similar uh, threshold rate growth rates for other countries and at other points in time, and as you can see, uh, these estimates vary a lot. Um, you know, in Germany in the 1970s it was 2.2 percent. Uh, in the U.S. in 1996 uh, it was estimated to be like zero percent, etc., etc. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot of variation uh, in these estimates, <clears throat> uh, which means that you know it's not really uh, it's it's a theory that does not really uh, have a lot of predictive power because these empirical these thresholds um, uh, vary all over the place. All right, so uh, another theory, uh, micro macroeconomic theory, with which you can try to explain unemployment rates is not to relate growth rates to uh, the unemployment rate but rather to relate the inflation rate of a country to its unemployment rate and um, you know this idea originates from uh, the so-called Phillips curve theorem um, which is based on empirical evidence for the UK uh, uh, you may have heard of it already in some other course and macroeconomic courses for example so it's based on empirical evidence from the UK, uh, which describe a relationship between the growth rate uh, of the wage rate, which is basically inflation, and the unemployment rate. And the conclusion that would, the policy implication that would follow from this observation, um, that whenever unemployment, whenever inflation is high, unemployment tends to be low, is that by increasing inflation uh, through, for example, monetary policy, 
uh, or fiscal policy, uh, one can reduce the level of unemployment. So there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment that could be utilized by policy. Okay, so this is a graphic representation of this Phillips curve relationship, uh, again, which was something that was discovered in the data for the UK, and then later uh, you know, confirmed for, for a bunch of other countries up to some point in time. Namely, that, uh, namely a negative relationship between um, uh, inflation and unemployment. So whenever inflation is high, uh, unemployment is low, and whenever inflation is low, unemployment tends to be high. So, uh, this was a relationship that was again confirmed or discovered for the UK um, way back, way back in, 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 the, in the past. Uh, the question is whether it prevails up to today. And uh, you know, this is a, this is a graph of uh, un inflation and unemployment uh, at different uh, points in time for different years for the US. And as you can see, that uh, what you can see here is that for more recent, um, uh, um, for the more, more recent period, um, you know, at the end of the 1990s, for example, this relationship seems to have completely broken down. You know, there is obviously no clear relationship between inflation and unemployment uh, at um, in this um, uh, you know for these years. Whereas you can see sort of a negative relationship uh, in in earlier years, right? Um, which means that uh, um, so let's let's skip this slide for a minute. Uh, which means uh, uh, that the um, that the explanatory power of the Phillips curve is not does not seem to be very strong uh, for more recent periods. And one reason why this may be not the case is the so-called Lucas critique. You know, after this relationship had been discovered, uh, policymakers started to um, try to exploit this relationship. You know, they started to deliberately increase the inflation rate in order to bring down the uh, unemployment rate. But once um, you know policymakers deliberately try to exploit this relationship, this it appears that this relationship has started to break down. Uh, and the reason why is obviously that uh, people anticipate that policymakers will try to exploit the relationship and therefore adopt their, adapt their behavior such that uh, it becomes more harder for the for the government to exploit this relationship, which means that this relationship ultimately breaks down. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, I mean, so many words, but basically, uh, what uh, the point that you should take away here is that uh, the reasons for unemployment have to be uh, identified and understood in detail. You can't really just, you know, claim some general macroeconomic relationships between growth and unemployment or inflation and unemployment. You should you need to know uh, how humans behave uh, at the microeconomic level in order to understand why how labor markets function and why you know there may be unemployment uh, at the end of the day okay let's go back uh, one slide and uh, you know go through these these um, these figures here uh, so this is basically uh, estimates for the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment for different countries at different points in time uh, basically the uh, uh, the unemployment rate when inflation is is sort of constant, you know, when the po when policymakers do not try to exploit, um, do not try to induce a lower unemployment rate by increasing inflation beyond its expected level. Okay, and as you can see, it's sort of this uh, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment varies uh, thus across countries and um, uh, uh, across points in time. You know, for example, in Spain, it tends to be much higher than in. Um, than in a country like uh, like the Netherlands, it's much lower. And the reason why is, of course, uh, is that people sort of uh, anticipate uh, higher inflation, um, uh, you know, seem to anticipate at least higher inflation in Spain than in the Netherlands. Um, all right, so um, so this is uh, 
So this is what we are going to do. Uh, we are going to try to understand the labor market uh, in detail by adapting, uh, by assuming a micro perspective. Okay. So what are the features of, of the labor market? Um, let's go through them. Uh, it's a complicated um, context to study because it has you know many, many uh, idiosyncratic features. So first of all, um, um, labor is a, is a production factor, uh, it's an input uh, such as uh, similar to capital, um, but it, it is also different from capital in that it is, um, it is an input that is ultimately, that ultimately consists of the time of human beings. Okay, so the traded good in a labor market is the time of a human itself unlike in other markets uh, or for capital goods where it's some you know some material uh, sorry where it's some material um, good uh, in the labor market the traded good is ultimately uh, the time of, of humans themselves uh, for many um, people, uh, labor is their central source, the main source of income when they are employed. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a good a market that is that has existential consequences, that may have existential consequences. <clears throat> Which means that, uh, you know, there may be strong demand for the, la for the government to regulate this market. Uh, for example, due to dismissal protections, workplace security, etc., etc. The labor market does not only you know confer income to you, but also may determine um, you know other other things um, in society. Uh, for example, you know to which social class you belong, depending on what job you have, um, what. Um, educational choices your ch children are going to make etc and the labor market may also have political consequences because you know most voters are employees um, they participate in the labor market as suppliers of labor so whatever the government so whatever go is going on in the labor market whatever the government for example is doing on the labor market may have implications for political equilibrium um, then there are ethical questions, um, you know, um, labor confers typically dignity to humans uh, and vice versa. If people are unemployed, uh, you know, it's not only a loss in income, but also this may also, uh, in addition, have consequences for their psyche. You know, it may lead to stigmatization, social isolation, etc., etc. Um, you know, uh, losing a job being unemployed may have consequences beyond the mere loss in income. Another feature of the labor market is that there is asymmetric power. Uh, typically, uh, one single individual em employee uh, does have much, much uh, less power uh, than the owner of, of, a, of a factory, of a firm, for example. So, whenever they negotiate about something, about a wage, for example, one side of the market um, may have much more power uh, under certain con conditions uh, than another side, uh, which is which is a feature that needs to be taken into account whenever we develop a model of the labor market. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, another feature of the labor market, um, due to the fact that the government has an incentive to uh, to to regulate that market is the existence of high regulation, which may have other, co which may affect labor market equilibria in certain ways. Uh, then there's asymmetric information, uh, you know, negotiations about wages, etc., uh, etc. Et so there are many, many features that needs to be taken into account whenever we want to try to understand the labor market. Okay, um, so, so. Um, you will take all that into account in this course. <clears throat> so, what will be uh, what are the main major building blocks of our analysis? Um, oh, there's a typo. 
but anyway so what is uh, what is going to be uh, what are, what is going to be the what are going to be the major building blocks of our analysis well as i've mentioned um, we will be talking about labor supply about labor demand and labor market equilibria where we bring demand and supply uh, um, together and then um, we will talk about institutions regulations of the labor market and how they affect uh, any equilibrium in that market okay so the aim of the lecture to to summarize um, you know what we've talked up to now uh, but what I've what I've told you up to now is to understand the basic economic aspects of the labor market uh, in order to understand the causes of unemployment um, whether it is insufficient insuff uh, sufficient demand uh, so whether there are not enough firms, whether unemployment is due to the fact that there are not enough firms demanding labor, but uh, um, unemployment may also be due to insufficient supply, uh, um, in a sense, uh, namely that uh, while firms may be demanding a lot of a lot of labor, those who are supplying labor, the laborers, may not offer the, the skills that are required by the firms, that are demanded by the firms. Uh, so there may be you know some mismatch which may be the main reason for the existence of unemployment not um, insufficient demand per se um, related to that you know it may be the lack of people with a particular education uh, that is that is demanded uh, so again some type of mismatch that is uh, responsible for uh, the existence of unemployment um, it may be a suddenly increasing number of people, um, etc. Et uh, some other facts um, you know, for you to take away is that there's uh, some difference in the level and trend between uh, the extent to which men and women um, participate in the labor market. So uh, any labor market analysis has a, has a strong gender component, if you will. Uh, so discussing gender is important um, in these models um, because uh, they are they are among other things you know marked differences across countries in the extent to which in particular women participate in the labor market uh, and then you know there are also as you may know uh, differences in the wages between men and women the when the gender wage gap which is something which you know, we will try to understand as well in this course there are differences not only between you know different genders uh, in wages but also between different regions between different levels of education uh, different ages etc and all of that you know we would like to understand as well you know why is it that you know people with uh, typically people with um, high levels of education receive a higher wage than people with lower levels of education why is it that the wages in certain regions are higher for the same job than in other regions you know, but does determine these types of things. Um, and similarly for unemployment, you know, there's a lot of variation across people, for example, along the dimension of gender, uh, along the dimension of education, age, or wherever they live. Um, and what does explain these, um, these, these, what does explain these differences? And then there are a couple of other questions which we'll be trying to find answers to as well in this course. Um, you know, you can go through them by yourself. All right, so this was the first lecture, and um, um, we'll see each other in the next lecture, I guess. So, see you.